Alright, so I'm uh, glad to see you guys have survived so far in this last lecture on survival too. Um, <clears throat> so far, three lectures I've given you in background, then talking about applications in, in, in biosensing, obviously now we're in cavities and cavity quantum dynamics. The last thing I wanted to talk about was optomechanics, which is an area which has really grown amazingly in the last in the last five years or so and which is an area which we're putting a lot of effort into here. I'm going to give you some background and then I'm going to talk to you about some experiments that we're doing. So um, I thought another title might be might be appropriate. Uh, I'm a quantum, uh, I run a quantum group, so uh, another title for this, this lecture might be Towards Quantum Mechanics. But the mechanics is metallics because I want to distinguish actual mechanical systems from analogies, such as the electronic states. Well, I guess that's mechanical too, but it's not. You know, the ele electronic states in matter aren't, aren't as mechanical, you might agree, as, say, a, a, a diamond ring or a candle or something like this. So, uh, the research I'm going to tell you about, I should, should acknowledge the people involved. So, there, were, there, there are two research fellows involved in this research. Joachim Fiddle and Quan Li. Quan is now at Coke here, the Center for, for Organic Photonics and Electronics. So there is some uh, cross fertilization I guess, between Quan and those six areas. Um, and there's a whole lot of students who are involved. So quantum optomechanical systems were first talked about by a guy called Briginsky uh, in the context, about 40 years ago, in the context of grabbing wave unfolders. These sort of massive interferometers, uh, these massive interferometers, uh, you know, several kilometer arm lengths uh, between two arms, and the idea is that if there's a big astronomical event, if two neutron stars collide, or I don't know, a barring spiral or something like this, then that distorts space time, and that distortion can be seen because it, if it's the right sort of distortion, it'll change the length of one of these arms and not the other. And if you interfere the light from both arms, then there's some interference, and, and you should see these gravity waves. So this was the context of optimal mechanics. Things have changed a little bit recently, as you can see. Um, the kind of sensitivity that, that you need to, 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 to send something like a gravity wave is predicted to be around 10 to the minus 23 root hertz. Um, as, as they keep failing to detect them, they seem to keep pushing this limit low, and I'm not sure where it's going to stop. But at some stage, I'm not sure if this is this limit, but the analogy was that you wanted to detect a change in the distance from the Earth to the Sun on the order of a hydrogen atom. That's the sort of, sort of, um, the sort of change in length, the path length you want to be able to detect. So there's very, very, very small changes. And the question is how would you go about increasing the sensitivity of interferometer, right? How can you get to this sort of this sort of sensitivity? Well, the first thing you can do is you can make the arms longer. Right? You make the arms longer and then if if the arm length changes by some factor, then the change is larger and you can see that. Um, and there's reasons why you might want to do this. One is on Earth you have some curvature issues, right? So you could put the neutrometer in space, which is what they're planning to do for MESA, the What's that called? The laser interferometer space based astronomy or something like that. Um, <clears throat> which is going to consist of three satellites following the Earth around an orbit, separated by five gigameters, whatever that is. That's about five million kilometers. So you can do this, but it's actually compromising because uh, the wavelength of the gravity waves that you care about. Uh, they define essentially the length of the, the interferometer arms. Right? So you get longer arms, you have to get a longer wavelength, which is lower frequencies. So depending on what you want to see, a long arm is not, is not necessarily what you want. So the other thing you can do, which uh, works probably better in general, is you can increase your laser power. If you keep turning up laser power, you've got more and more photons per second, you can do more and more averaging, you can get a better measurement. Right? Um, there's a limit to this though. Right? This is what Brzezinski proposed. So if you think about the mirrors 
and into the center of it, that as photons impact those mirrors, they impart some momentum to make the mirrors start to vibrate. Right? If the photons are randomly distributed, then they're, they're creating a random noise on the motion of the, of the mirrors. And at some point, as you crank your power up, that, that random noise has a, 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 the effect of that uh, is worse than the, the improvement you get. You get, you get a, a degradation which is larger than the improvement you get from increasing your optical power, right? And the point at which these two effects, this radiation pressure and shock noise, are equal, it's called the Stirling quantum limit. So without, doing, without some sort of unusual quantum state, you're in front of it. You can't, or some sort of uh, you know, quantum control techniques, you can't do better than this limit. So this is a picture of sort of the noise balance, I guess, for, for uh, LIGO, the neutrometer I put on the start. This is, this is frequency, that's kind of like inverse time. So this is, so, so this is like measuring for longer time, or equivalently measuring more photons. And what you see is your shot noise goes down as you increase the power. But at some point, you start to get this radiation pressure increasing the noise. So this is, this is the standard quantum limit. This is current LIGO. You can see that the, the well shot noise limited up here, but, but actually they're limited by other things down the bottom. Uh, the next generation of LIGO, so they're not at the standard quantum limit. The next generation of LIGO is predicted to get, get there, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so the whole lot of noise you're going to worry about. There are some noise sources which you may not predict. So this is, this is a, a, I imagine the people monitor, you know, waiting for gravity waves in the, in the um, central station of LIGO, and then some, some hoon in one of their cars crashes into the interferometer arm. Oh, gravity wave! <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so when Progensky was first talking about this quantum optical mechanical effects, this effect of photon radiation pressure on mechanical systems, he was really thinking, you know, think of it as a thought experiment. So this is a quote from 1992, he says, this is more a thought experiment than the foundation for a real measurement device. Right, since then, there have been a it really, in the last five years, there have been a whole host of developments, uh, which I can't do justice by in this talk, so I'm not going to, I'm afraid, but across a whole range of different size scales, which seek to really make you know, the, these, these, make real measurement devices, which, which are based somehow on quantum optical mechanical effects. So, I find it quite incredible that you can that you can worry about optomechanics, quantum optomechanics, the gravity wave detectors, which could be five gigameters large, all the way down to, to these sort of picogram, micro and nanoscale systems. They all have the same sort of effect going on, and and and, and they all look likely to 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 get the story gene where, where you have quantum quantum effects. So quantum Caveat and mechanical systems, that's what I've got here, quantum comms, uh, are, are one of the systems that looks most, which is the most, which is one of the most promising candidates to see quantum, these quantum mechanical effects because they have, they have very low mass, uh, they have high mechanical resonance frequency, they have, they have high, sorry, yeah, high mechanical resonance frequencies as well as high optical Q and high mechanical and ideally what you want to do is you want to cool one of these systems to its ground state so there's no thermal vibrations. And then you want to look at the interaction between photons in your cavity and this vibration of the mechanical cantilever. So the question is why would I care about that? That's the obvious question, right? Why would I care about this esoteric quantum mechanical behavior of the mechanical system? Well, the first thing I think is really cool about this is, is that you can you can think about doing experiments that test the interface between general relativity and quantum mechanics, right? Because as you go to increasingly large systems, massive systems, then those systems can interact with gravity, right? If I can make that a quantum system that can interact with gravity, then I have a real system that I can probe that, that uh, uh, respond, which, which somehow is in between general relativity. Uh, so I think that would be a really nice thing to be able to work on 
we're not there yet. Maybe in a decade we'll be in a situation where we have large enough systems that this becomes this becomes feasible. Um, other things that I think are really nice are the idea that you can you can make a fundamental temperature standard out of this. So if you can cool the mechanical system to its ground state, or even just count the number of photons in the mechanical system, then you know that the energy of the system is just the number of photons times h bar omega, right? Number of photons, sorry, times h bar omega. And you know that that's equal to kT. So if you define k, then you've got a thermometer, which is a fundamental thermometer that tells you the temperature. So, so I think that's kind of a nice idea. The other thing I think is really cool is the idea of doing um, uh, of doing uh, nonlinear quantum dynamics experiments. So mechanical systems are very nonlinear, and and if you look at something like light, it's actually quite hard to get nonlinearity. So you have to have you have to build up light intensities somewhere very large um, to get to get to get an appreciable effect. In mechanical systems nonlinearity is so strong they're really a problem a lot of the time. So if we can have a mechanical system, so in a mechanical system we can have far stronger nonlinearities in the experiments that you really can't think about doing in optical systems. Um, and obviously there are other things, so uh, what have we got here? You can generate non-classical states in mechanical systems. Obviously, uh, mechanical candles are used in a lot of sensors, so AFM is the classic example. If you can condition the quantum state of these candles, then you may be able to improve those sorts of those sorts of um, work. You know, microscopes. Okay, so I always like to start these talks, I'm not sure why, it's probably because I'm just from a quantum optics background, by looking at, at what is a non classical optical state. So, um, an optical state is formally analogous to a harmonic oscillator, so it's formally analogous to a mechanical cantilever or, or pendulum or something like this. You define the annihilation operator in terms of position momentum operators, right, which have, there's a mass here and frequency. We tend to not like talking about mass for light, right? So we don't like to draw the analogy too strong, and so what we do is we hide that in these two quadrature operators, x plus and x minus. And you can just think about the field as being some vector, some phasor on a phasor diagram. This is the phase, that's the amplitude of the field, and these are these two quadratures. And quantum mechanics tells you there's an uncertainty principle in amplitude between position and momentum, which means there's an uncertainty position, uncertainty principle in amplitude and phase, which means you don't know exactly the direction of this vector, right? So, a nice thought experiment to do, I think, is to think, let's, okay, let's say we've got a thermal state, so if the variance of the amplitude and phase quotient is the same, then we, we, know, we know what the, what the mean number of photons of the cavity is, it's just given by, sorry, in the, yeah, the field is, it's just given by the bose einstein distribution, and we can work out from A dagger A2, so we can link the bose einstein distribution to the variance of the quantum state. If I rearrange this, I get the variance is equal to 1, plus some stuff. The 1 is quantum. So that's saying, saying it doesn't matter how cold you make the system, there's some, there's some noise in the field. There's some fundamental electric field fluctuations. And then this stuff is your thermal noise. Now you can see there's this ratio h bar omega on kT. So omega is the frequency, t is the temperature. So this ratio is like the ratio of the energy of a photon to the thermal energy. If that ratio is large, right, then it's hard for thermal energy to produce one photon in the mode, a photon in the mode, sorry. Um, so if that ratio is large, I've got this exponential is large, which means it's larger than one, which means I've got one plus two divided by a large number, two divided by a large number is zero, near enough, so I get vacuum noise. If the ratio is small, then the vacuum noise is, is, is negligible. So if I plug in numbers from optimal field, then what I find is the frequency is around 10 to 15 grams per second, temperature is about 300 Kelvin, so that ratio is 100. If I plug that in, I find that the vacuum noise dominates the thermal noise by a factor of 10 to the 43. So essentially, for quantum optics, we absolutely don't care about thermal noise. We don't. The, if you have a mode in free space, the chance that, you know, the fact that it's a 300 Kelvin, the chance that that thermal energy can, can put a photon in the mode is just completely negative. So, so that is really a key point. 
and it's been critical to the success of the federal quantum optics. We haven't had to worry about noise. We get it for free. We just immediately vacuum noise limited, shot noise limited. And then if we do anything nonlinear, we produce some, some quantum state, some non classical state. In mechanical systems, this is not the case. So, so now I'm not drawing the analogy anymore. This is, now it's, it's, this is direct. I've just so so. Um, so this is the same. This is the same thing as for light, but with the actual masses and things left in, right? And this is the, the variance of the position of the upper, of oscillator. Here, uh, what you find is because the resonance frequency is much lower. Sorry about the formatting. Uh, are much lower. So they're not 10 to the 15, they're more like 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 10. In order, in order for, the thermal, for the vacuum noise to dominate the thermal noise, the temperature has to be around, and that's 30 microcalvin, around, let's say, let's say 1 millicalvin, something on that order, right? So, so in order to see anything quantum in these systems, you need, you need to have a high resonance frequency to make that temperature as high as possible, right? Um, and you need to have a very, very, very low temperature, lower than you can get in any sort of standard print. Okay, so this challenge is number two. Now, two, you know, number one and two. Now, the problem is, the, the real problem now is, well, okay, you've got the thing behaving quantum mechanically, can you see it, right? Its oscillation isn't real large. So, can you, can you, can you observe the oscillation in the system? The zero point motion, this is just, this is just taking, the vacuum noise in this expression and square rooting it is given by this. So you can see it goes inversely with mass. The smaller the mass, the larger the motion. That makes sense because uh, you know when you apply a force, the oscillator moves more. And the smaller the resonance frequency, and the large, and the smaller the resonance frequency, the larger the motion. So now we want to make the resonance frequency small. We can't just keep pushing the resonance frequency up because that makes the quantum motion go down. The quantum motion goes down. You can't see it. So if I plug in some typical numbers, what you find is that I need sensitivity on the order of 10 to the minus 14 meters. I need you able to sense, I need you able to sense the motion of this cantilever to within, you know, a millionth of a hydrogen atom or something like that. No. 10,000 of a hydrogen atom in one second, if I've got one second to measure. So that's pretty crazy, right? So, so these are the challenges. You really want to have low mass at the point, and, and then you need to have some way to, to monitor motion of the system very, very sensitively. So, for the, really the system that were, where these sorts of ideas were, were, were pioneered on the last, I don't know, uh, 15 years, is uh, are MEMS and NEMS systems, micro mechanical systems. So here are some examples. The idea is that you have some sort of cantilever, some sort of guitar string, and then you have, in this case, a capacitor. And as the guitar string moves, it changes the electrical circuit. And you can use something like a single electron transistor to read out the motion of the cantilever. Right? Now, these systems are very, very precise, but they're not at that level. <coughs> so they're at a level of about. So the sensitivity you get is about 10 to the minus 15 meters per hertz. So if you can measure it in one, over one second, you can get a sensitivity sufficient to what you need, but you can't measure it in a second. Because the oscillator is completely decayed, you can't get a, you, you can't have the oscillator. The coherent, the coherence of the oscillator is not a second; it's much smaller. So, so they're not sufficient. However, having said that, this paper came out in Nature a couple of months ago, uh, which is the first observation of quantum uh, of the quantum ground state in mechanical oscillator, in mechanical cantilever. Now, ions, I should say, ions are mechanical oscillators. And people have worked on them for a long time and, 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 and got them ground state cool. So ions are a system where people are way ahead of, of us doing the cat, you know, macroscopic mechanical, mechanical work. Um, but if you want to do something like, if you want to look at gravitational effects or anything with mass or, sen or sensing, then, then these mechanical systems offer some avenues that you don't get with ions. So, okay. So, so this experiment involved coupling the mechanical system to an atom, essentially, actually a superconducting qubit, right? And they could use, um, essentially they use a lot, of, a lot of averaging in order to reach, in order to be able to confirm that the resonator is in its current state. Okay, so, so that's really exciting. 
for everyone involved. Uh, right, so back to opt-in mechanics. So, so opt-in mechanics provide a way to very, very critically sensitively read out the motion of mechanical systems. So if you just plug in the number for a system like this, you've got a cantilever and you've got a mirror, and as the cantilever vibrates, the phase of the light that's from it changes and you read that out, then you can get down to about 10 to the minus 22 meters per reverse. In principle, now no one's got there yet. People have got 10 to the minus 19 meters per reverse, right? Um, but that's, I mean, 10 to the 10 to the minus 10 meters is a hydrogen atom. So, you know, it's hard to imagine that sort of, that sort of distance. Okay, but you need, again, ultra high quality to your work on. So in microtorians, it turns out, are really a natural candidate for these sorts of experiments. The reason is that you have both ultra high Q optical modes and high Q mechanical modes. So these are some examples of mechanical modes in a microtorian. So you can kind of think of it like a drum, except that instead of being attached around the edges, it's attached around the middle, right? And you've got all these modes. You can have a mode that vibrates like this, or a mode that ripples around the edge, or a whole, whole host of different modes. So in this case, we're, we're, we're measuring, what we're doing is we're sitting slightly off an optical resonance. As the cavity vibrates, the intensity of the light changes because it covers more of the cavity, less of the cavity. And if we plug in the, the output of the cavity uh, into spatial analyzing, you start to see these spikes and characteristic frequencies which correspond to each of these modes. Okay. So if we look at, let's just have a look at those two those criteria I talked about before. So typical sort of characteristic for microtroid mode, the resonance frequency might be 100 megahertz, it's a bit high resolution. The effective mass might be uh, 10 to the minus 9 kilograms, something like that. And the Q might be, that's the more like 50,000 mechanical Q. So you start ringing and ring 50,000 times before it damps out. So if you use those numbers and you plug them in to our equations for the zero point motion of the thermal, Freeze out temperature, you find, sorry about that, uh, you find the zero point fluctuation is around 10 to the minus 17 meters. You should be able to get 10 to the minus 22 per root hertz uh, without, without chloroids, so that should be observable. And then we find that the thermal freeze out temperature is around 5 millicalvin. You can get to that with a dilution refrigerator, right? Um, unfortunately, you can't really use a dilution refrigerator in our sort of system with a toroid because uh, you need an exchange of gas to cool it. It's a, it's a little disc of, sil of silica, which is thermally isolating, sitting on a thin pedestal of silicon. All the light is heating the perimeter of it. The only way to, the only way to cool it if you haven't got exchange gas is for, the, is for the heat to travel all the way in through the, to the insulator, the thermal insulator, and then down through the post, which just doesn't happen. You've got light into it, it's going to heat So you need another way to extract heat which is using exchange gas. So the, the only exchange gas you can choose is helium-3, uh, which, which uh, becomes superfluid at 300 millicalvin. So you can't really use, you can't have any fridge which goes below 300 millicalvin, at least that I know of. Um, so, so we have a, a helium-3 price set, which gets us down to 300 millicalvin, and the idea is to use some sort of active cool, the kind of stuff they do with ions and with atoms. Um, to call further So one thing you might have noticed is that I said that I think we can measure the motion of the oscillator to better than the, than, than the zero point motion, right? If we can measure the motion to better than zero point motion, we have to apply back, that has to apply back action on the resonator. Because there's a high value uncertainty principle, if you know the position to better than the high value uncertainty, then, then you know, the zero point motion, you've got to know the momentum worse. So, so this is radiation pressure. You, you observe the system, and your observation impacts the system, increases the momentum, makes it more noisy. So this is sort of a, a, a flow diagram, if you like, of the system. You have your mechanical oscillator, you make some observations of it, that introduces quantum noise back action. But you can also use control. You can take your knowledge from the transduction, your measurement of the position, and you can feed it back to, to control the mechanical oscillator. So this bank action can be a really bad thing. It can cause heating and loss of precision. But if you make your measurements right, you use the right sort of feedback, 
then you can use it to 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 do cooling or to enable uh, off precise measurements and things like this. So I wanted to give one example of this. Just going to check the time. Um, so this example is going back to gravity wave interferometers. You take a gravity wave interferometer, right? You crank up the power so this mirror starts to vibrate. I'm going to ignore that mirror here as an example. Um, so this mirror starts to vibrate through radi radiation pressure. So if I put a second mirror here and read out the motion of that mirror, then I can use feedback, I can detect, I can detect the motion of this mirror and feed it back to suppress it. Turns out if you do that, then, then you can surpass the, the um, standard quantum limit in the interferometer, so you can prove the uh, sensitivity of the interferometer. So, so I guess the point here is that a key technolo technological requirement is felt for the for quantum control of the mechanical systems development simultaneously and independently drive and observe the mechanical motion of the system. So that's what we've been working on achieving at EQ. So, all right, so this is how we transduce or observe the mechanical motion. We have a toroid, we couple to it with a fiber. So forget about this for a moment. We have a probe laser. The probe laser sits slightly detuned off the resonance of the toroid. And then as the resonance shifts, right, because Torrents are vibrating, the optical path length changes, we see, we see shifts in the intensity leaving the cavity. And when we take a Fourier transform of that, we see peaks like I showed you before. Uh, this is, so this is uh, an example. This is just Brownian motion of, of the resonances inside the cavity. We've got three resonances the fundamental crown mode, which is sort of doing this. The fundamental uh, flexural mode, which is doing this, and a second order crown mode, which is which is essentially the same as this mode, but but, but um, twice over in one cycle. And looking at this, you can see that the sensitivity we've got is on, is it's about ten to minus eighteen meters per reverse. In fact, in fact, we do it better than that now. We get more like five or ten to minus nineteen meters per reverse. So pretty good, not good enough yet. But, you know, we have a number of ways to improve that. So the question is, how do you do, how can we do actuation? How can we control, now that we know the motion of the resonator, how can we feed back and control it accurately? Um, in optomechanics, there's really been only one way to do that prior to this, which, which was using radiation pressure. So you take a high power laser, you modulate it, and you make the, the system vibrate. Um, so, so we were interested in the kind of techniques that we use in NEMS, because they're much stronger, so you use electrical actuation. If you've got a charged cantilever, for example, and you apply an electric field across it, then it's going to start to move, and, and you apply a large and larger electric field, you can get a very large movement. So we want to use electrical actuation, both because of that, and also because that means you can, um, <clears throat> you, can uh, you can apply filters, electrical filters. You can, you can use uh, all of the technology we have available in electronics to help control, to control the, the, the optical system. And, and you can think about coupling it to systems like superconductive qubits. Right, so this is what we're trying to do. Um, and while we were getting our results, this was published. Now, this is, so this is, this is a technique which is essentially the technique we use called electrical gradient force actuation where you, you, you apply an electric field over a dielectric resonator and the electric field polarizes the resonator and then the resonator wants to go to the peak of the electric field. So you can make it move. Right? This is quite a beautiful technique because you don't have, it's not like you need to grab hold of the resonator and move it. So, so it's not, it's not dissipative. It's, um, you don't introduce damping, or at least depression in damping here, uh, with this technique. So the question was, can we apply that to Optomechanical systems instead of electromechanical system, and the way we did this was to uh, put a sharp electrode over the top of the toroid. That electrode, if you put a voltage across, it, so you put a voltage across between a flat electrode on the bottom and that electrode on the top, and you get essentially you get what looks like a, you get a point charge building up at the point of the electrode. So you get this sort of you get this electric field distribution of a point. And that has a large gradient around the toroid, so we should be able to polarize the toroid and apply force. Um, 
turns out indeed that works. So this is, I wish I had, um, so this is the zero point motion. I wish I had the, the, the um, Brownian motion here. So what we're doing is we're, we're, uh, we've got a network analyzer, we're applying a voltage from the network <coughs> analyzer to the tip, and then we're scanning the frequency across um, this range here, and we're looking at the response of the toroid to that motion, to that, to that, to that uh, voltage. And what you see is you get this very large enhancement at the peaks of those two modes, I told you about before. In our case, we've got a maximum gradient force of about 0.4 micronewtons. We've only got that up by about four orders of magnitude, so to what would that be? Four millinewtons. 0.4 micronewtons would, have, would, would require 50 milliwatts intergraph of cavity power if we want to do radiation pressure. 50, sorry, did I say milliwatts? 50 watts of intergraphic power if we want to do it by, by radiation pressure. If you did this in a cry stack, the toroid would heat by many, 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 many degrees. Far more than if we get away with it if you want to get to the ground state. Um, the other comment is I, I really like, you know, when we increase the excitation voltage, I'd like these traces to go nonlinear because I want to, be, I want to start seeing counter-linearities, and we haven't yet, so it looks like we need more, more voltage. <coughs> what? I don't think I'll mention this, I don't think I have time. Uh, so the, the point of this is just that if you, if you can optically observe and electrically actuate toroids, then you can, you can measure the chemical ro response by scanning your probe across the surface of the cavity, just like you would for an AFM. <coughs> so, what, so what we wanted to demonstrate here was that you can control the motion of, of toroids. So what, what we did in this case was cooling. So the idea is, if you know the position of the toroid, as a function of time, then well, I, what you want to do is apply a viscous damping force. So you want to apply a force that's opposite the velocity. Imagine, imagine slowing down a child on a swing, right? You don't want to push them window at the top. That's just going to increase the energy. If you push them up, it increases the potential energy. If you push them down, it increases their, 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 their kinetic energy. Um, kind of. um, you want to push them window at the bottom. When they're traveling at the fastest speed, you want to push them in the opposite direction. So that's what we want to do here. So the, but, but we're measuring position. And we need to know the velocity. Uh, it turns out that there's a simple relationship between the two, right? You wait half a cycle and the position becomes the velocity. If the, if the um, pendulum is high up here, you, a quarter of a cycle, uh, then a quarter of a cycle later, that, that potential energy is being converted into, into kinetic energy. So, so what you want to do is you want to delay, you want to detect the position of the oscillator, delay by a quarter of a cycle, and feed back to the position of the to the to the momentum of the oscillator to slow down. So that's indeed so this is what I'm saying here, sorry. And that's indeed what, what we did. And it turns out when you do this, then you get cooling. And this is sort of how cooling works. Um, <coughs> uh, if you ignore the stuff in brackets for, for a start, if I increase the gain of my feedback, I can keep cooling. In principle indefinitely. However, there's some noise in your transduction, right? This transduction noise. And, and you're imprinting it on the oscillator and making it move. Right? So, so that's what the sigma to noise ratio is. You want to keep that as low as, as, as high as possible, but at some point, your transduction noise clamps the temperature you can get to, which is like this. And if you go higher, if you go higher gains, the temperature increases. So this is, this is the experiment we implemented. We've got two lasers, one at 1550 and one at 980 nanometers. I'll talk about why we have two in a minute. Uh, we couple them into the toroid and, and we detect its motion with both of them. We take, uh, we take the 1550 nanometer signal and we feed that back. Uh, uh, sorry, we take the 980 nanometer signal and we feed that back through a delay line onto the electrode, which, which then acts to damp out. The motion, the gradient motion of toroid from the other. So this is what you observe on the on that uh, what I'm going to call the in-loop probe. Uh, if I just detect, if I just detect the, the if I measure the spectrum of this signal, that should tell me the temperature, right? If I have no feedback, this is gradient, this is the gradient motion. The temperature is proportional to the area under there. And now I crank up the gain, and what I see is I start to keep cooling. Amplitude goes down. Um, and that means the area goes down. And if the area goes down, the energy goes down, and the temperature goes down. 
Now we can see this very strange thing. We keep increasing the gain, and eventually, the seam goes down below zero. Right? And, well, below, not below zero, but below the transduction noise. So it looks like you're cooling to negative temperatures. Right? The area here is now negative. What's really going on is, is, is that your feedback, what, it's really what your feedback is trying to do is minimize the signal detected at the detector. And some of that comes from the noise and some of it comes from the cavity, right? from the vibrations of the cavity. So your feedback to the cavity and making it move anti-correlated with the noise on your transduction, which is canceling, canceling the transduction noise out. This is called squashing. So you're actually getting up with less noise than, than, than the initial sensitivity of your system, but it's spurious. It's really that you're, you're heating the cavity in order to make this happen. So this is why we have the second, the second probe, which is out of loop. So it's uncorrelated. So the noise on it is uncorrelated with the motion of the cavity. And what you see then is that instead of going down negative, the transaction, the, the signal just flattens out. And you can plot, and you can plot the temperature of, of the mechanical oscillator as a function of gain. What you see is this, these uh, uh, blue, well, the blue curve is, is the in loop temperature. This is the temperature with, with the system where the noise is correlated with the motion of the oscillator, and we're feeding back the oscillator. And, and you can see that goes below zero eventually, actually. The red curve, so that's not a real temperature. The red curve maps out the real temperature perfectly, uh, very well, which is the outer loop temperature. So, so the big question is how far are we away from this quantum regime that we want to get to? Um, OK, so the temperature requirement in our case by plugging the numbers is we need to get down to about 300 microcalvin. The heat, our helium 3 cryostat tells us to 300 millicalvin, so we need another factor of 1,000. How can we get there? Well, the first thing we can do is we can choose a mechanical mode with a high resonance frequency. We can multiply a factor of about 10. That gets us to 3 millicalvin. And then we need another factor of 100 from, from these active cooling techniques. So I think we can, we can do that. OK, so the second requirement was the transduction requirement. The zero point motion of our cap oscillator is about 10 to the minus 20 meters per root hertz. So in principle, we can get 10 to the minus 22 meters per root hertz. So we can get there. It might be uh, uh, challenging to do that. There's some other ways to improve this. So one, OK, increase the optical quality of the cavity. That gives, it should give us a factor of 10. You, you, you make the laser shot noise limited. At the moment, our laser is limited by phase noise. It gives you a factor of 30. Um, but probably the most attractive thing is to engineer your mechanical oscillator. So if you make the damping of the mechanical oscillator less, and you make the, the mass smaller, then, then the spectrum gets narrower, and all that thermal energy gets in the smaller frequency range and pokes higher above your transaction units. So, come on, there's the time. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so where, where I really want to go in the medium term is to get this area, I want to be able to exploit the mechanical nonlinearities because if you look at quantum optics in the past three decades, the reason it's been successful is that, that people have been able to, to exploit optical nonlinearities. All of quantum optics are based on, on optical nonlinearities. So, so I really want to get there. That means we can start to engineer non-classical states, mechanical systems, we can look at quantum computing and communication systems and look at measurements past the same quantum limit with the mechanical system. But the nice thing with the mechanical systems is in an optical system, right, the nonlinearity is really just a fundamental property of the atoms. So you've got an atom, you apply electric field, it sort of it, it strains the electron orbitals, right? And if there's some nonlinear response if the electron orbital, then you get a nonlinearity. There's not much you can do to engineer that. Hard. You can, there's some things you can do, but it's hard. <coughs> in a mechanical system, the nonlinearity is due to the stress and strain on the system. So just by changing the mechanical structure, I can change the nonlinearity. So I have a really good lever, which allows me to change the nonlinearity of the mechanical system. And in fact, yeah, the nonlinearity is generally much higher than the optical system. So you can look at doing experiments that people have talked about in optics, but not been able to do. 
bunch of screen and cat generation screen and cat states and things like that. And you can access new types of nonlinearity. Um, so, so the main sort of sort of nonlinearity I, I care about is these parametric processes. In optics, what that means is you take a really powerful drive field, many, many photons of drive, and every now and then one of those photons is split because of the nonlinearity and form two correlated photons, a pair of photon pair, which you can use for quantum experiments and in metrology, I suppose, as well. I want to do the same sort of thing here. I want to drive one mode very, very hard. I want to drive this mode very, very hard. And hopefully, I'll get a photon in that mode to, to create a pair of photons in the second, second mode. That'd be, I guess, the first step towards towards doing nonlinear mechanics in these sort of systems. That sort of process allows you to do things like noise amplification. You can take a signal and amplify it up. Um, so if you've got a weak mechanical signal, you can amplify that above your detection noise floor. <coughs> and it allows you to engineer more classical mechanical states. So to summarize, um, it looks as if it's going to be feasible to make optimal mechanical systems behave in a quantum mechanical way. Uh, that, that means that you have a real macroscopic system that you can see with your naked eye behaving quantum mechanically. The system has mass, so you can apply it to problems that you haven't been able to apply quantum mechanical systems to before. Um, in order to, to use this sort of system, you, really, you need to be able to sense the motion, you need to be able to control the motion, right? These are critical techniques. And so what we've demonstrated here is that, is that you can, if you use a combination of optical sensing and electronic control, then, then you really get, in some sense, you get the best of both worlds from optical mechanics and no electronic. Surface roughness and things like that, I don't think that matters at all. But the bulk properties matter. So, how far undercut you are, or um, whether there's some eccentricity in the, in the disk, they, may, they have an effect and they shift the modes around a bit. But you're only, only talking about the frequencies might shift by 10%. Right? So, it's pretty predictable. If not, uh, let us thank our speaker and all speakers in the <laughs> So it's now happy time of barbecue.